Planes go up, planes go down. What planes don't do is just vanish off the face of the earth. We have breaking news. Malaysia Airlines confirms it has lost contact with a plane carrying 227 passengers. It seems to have vanished into the net. What do we tell the family members? What do we tell the media? My daughter asked me, where is Papa? It's just so unimaginable. I felt completely shattered. I lived in denial about the plane having some sort of crash. The world stops, quoi. Tout d'un coup, I dis, mais c'est pas possible. C'est un cauchemar. Réveillez-moi. What happens next is like a rip in the fabric of reality. Theories about the missing plane aren't going viral. It's possible it was hijacked. We don't know. This very mysterious and very suspicious cargo. The pilot's home flight simulator was removed by police. I have the real evidence. It's there, and you can't deny that. Never in history have 239 people been declared dead on the basis of mathematics alone. Some debris has been found. Who planted there? Who brought the peace there? Ils se foutent de nous. Ils se moquent de nous. They are lying from the beginning. They are lying to the whole world. MH370 is not just an unsolved mass murder. It's potentially an act of war. How is it possible for an airline to disappear out of thin air? Someone knows the answer. The question is who? That was the trailer for the new Netflix docuseries, MH370, The Plane That Disappeared. And this is Factual America. I'm your host, Matthew Sherwood. Each week I watch a hit documentary and then talk with the filmmakers and their subjects. Malaysian Airlines Flight 370 was supposed to be a routine trip, but it was anything but routine, as the commercial airliner disappeared without a trace over the Indian Ocean. Or was it the South China Sea? or Kazakhstan. Seemingly, no one knows. The plane's disappearance made headlines, sparked riots, plunged the passengers next of kin into a never-ending nightmare, and generated a global search for answers that never came. Join us as we talk with Louise Malkinson and Harry Hewland, the filmmakers behind MH370, The Plane That Disappeared, about this story full of conspiracies and rabbit holes, shadowy figures, and official silence. As Louise and Harry put it, it's an opportunity to keep alive the memory of those who were lost in one of the great unsolved mysteries of our time and to keep pushing for answers. Stay tuned. Louise and Harry, welcome to Factual America. How are things with you, Louise? Good, thanks. Really good to be here. Yeah, it's great to have you. And Harry? I'm well, thank you. Yeah, I'm a little cold. Um... Yeah, I'm in my office. I actually have a hot water bottle, Matthew, right here, keeping me warm because the heating is uh, not working in my office. But, uh, yeah. You see, uh, uh, you see, uh, my uh, you're a, a man after my uh, wife's heart. She doesn't go anywhere around the house without a hot water bottle, so we go through quite a few of those uh, in any given year. Um, well, we're not here to talk about hot water bottles, at least not yet. We can we can go back to that uh, that uh, topic, but we're here to talk about. MH370, The Plane That Disappeared. It's a Netflix docuseries releasing on March 8th, which is an important date in, uh, in this, as we will be discussing quite shortly. So welcome again to Factual America, and congratulations for uh, getting this to Netflix. And you must be very excited about the, um, the upcoming release, and I'm sure you're doing a lot of these, uh, the, the dog and pony show and all that. So, uh, so thanks again for making time for us. Um, I guess before asking the, you know, starting the conversation, um, again, reminder, we're talking about MH370, the plane that disappeared. Maybe a little spoiler alert. Um, There's a lot of uh, twists and turns in this tale, and you guys go down some rabbit holes. And so uh, it releases on March 8th, which is probably about the time this is going to release. So if you're listening to this, you may not have had a chance to... um, see the series yet so you might want to go watch it first and then come back uh, but with that in mind uh, Louise maybe you can start us off and give us a synopsis what is uh, MH370 all about 
So, um, yeah, it's uh, MH370, the plane that disappeared um, in 2014, Malaysian airline MH370 um, vanished along with 239 passengers on board. Um, and uh, nine years later, uh, the plane still hasn't been found. So this um, series, we speak to um, families of people that were on board. We speak to journalists and searchers across the globe who have been working for the last nine years to try and find out what's happened to the plane. And Harry, I mean, this is one of the biggest mysteries of aviation history, isn't it? It is. It is. I mean, it gets banded around a lot, that phrase, but with good reason for this story. I mean, it, it's one of the reasons why, you know, it's important to us that the plane that disappeared was in the title. You know, I think we wanted people to know that this is that story, you know. Um, and also, I think because it has no ending, this story, you know, the mystery mm. is not solved. It's one that if you talk to people about it, you know, um, they'll say, oh, is that still missing? You know, like, I, I didn't know that. Didn't the pilot do it? Yeah. And, you yeah. know, they, they yeah. don't because yeah. we don't, there is no ending. No ending has been reported. So, um, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's it, it remains, you know, the world's greatest aviation mystery for sure. Yeah, planes don't just disappear except this one did. Um, and so, Louise, with the, that's an interesting point. It has no ending. Um and so um, is that how, you know, that's a challenge, isn't it, for a documentary filmmaker to, to tell a story that doesn't have an end? Um, uh, is, that, uh, is that what you, you know, is, is that the first thing that kind of came to mind when you started working on this, um, how you're going to frame it, given that uh, there is no ending? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, we all... We all, or whenever we tell stories, we always want to begin in a middle and an end, don't we? And I think, you know, I think one of the things that struck me when I first started looking into this was, you know, that challenge in itself. You know, we don't, we we don't have an end into this, and that for me resonated with, um, you know, the the next of kin because mm. to not have any answers nine years later after this plane goes missing is just unimaginable. And I think that was something that was really, you know, the, the next of kin have been incredibly, you know, they're, they're central, mm. they are the part of this this film. And I think um, just not knowing um, is just something that we can't, you know, we, we're not, we, we can't process really, you know, we need to be able to tell, we need an end into a story. Um, and I think, you know, sort of to, to, to be able to kind of look at this story, to be able to kind of put it, back out there in the public domain to say that look you know this is the greatest aviation mystery of all time and we still don't have an answer to it was really important for us and to be able to tell the story of the people who have been affected by it for this you know for the for the nine years since it's been been missing and that is the next of kin as long alongside all of mm. the journalists um the experts have all been trying to find the answer mm. and and harry i mean i think that's i mean as uh, Louise is saying, I mean, it, that's, um, that's, is that sort of what, because there have been other MH370 docs and TV shows and stuff like that, but is that what, is that what, what is, what distinguishes this, this series? I mean, besides being done by yourselves and being excellent yeah. and everything, but I mean, what is it, what is, what are you bringing to the table that maybe others haven't? Is it this, is part of it that uh, angle, the, uh, the, 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 the passengers' families and loved ones. Oh, well, they're, they're the central voice in it, absolutely. Yeah. They're all the most important. We realized that from the beginning. I mean, look, we weren't naive enough to go into this thinking that, you know, um, after nine years with teams of scientists and aviation <laughs> experts from around the world not having solved yeah. the mystery, a bunch of TV producers were going to do it. <laughs> you know? um, yeah. We, you know, that really wasn't our objective. We just wanted to meet as many of the people as we could that had been most affected by this and who mm -hmm. were at the heart of the story. You know, as Lou says, from the next of kin to the officials who were, you know, wrestling with trying to provide answers in a totally unprecedented situation to journalists scratching their heads and trying to present the story to the rest of the world when there were no answers. Everybody has a different story about how they were sucked into MH370. Right. And... You know, we couldn't tell all of those stories, but we wanted to include as many of them as possible, really, and tell the kind of the human story of, of the impact of MH370 mm -hmm. and what this kind of mystery 
can do to people um, rather than, you know, roll our sleeves up with the science and trying to solve the mystery, right, you know, right. which, we, you know. And so with that in mind, Louise, I mean, did you have any idea where this was going to lead you when you got started on this project? I mean, there is that old, you know, it's an overused cliche, but the peeling of an on onion and all that stuff. But, uh, you know, when, what is the film that you ended up with? Is it what you envisioned, envisaged, I guess, the looking like when you started going into this? I think um, it was interesting is when I remember I remember the plane going missing in 2014, and, and as Harry was saying before, you sort of I knew what happened. I knew it was I you know it, it was international news at the time, but I, I I didn't really know what happened since. You know, I wasn't sure whether or not the plane had actually been found. And I think what was as we started to dig into it, um, it's it is such an incredible story where there are so many questions and there are far more questions than there are answers and I think you know as we were going through it and you know we were talking to people and hearing different people's theories and opinions you know you'd get so far down a one track and then suddenly you think well no that can't possibly be true and I think um, what was really interesting was seeing how um, you know looking at looking at it and, and and seeing all the, you know, talking about the different theories and, and, and looking at all those questions that are still there and then thinking about how we could pose all of that, put all that together into a series and kind of um, tell a sort of comprehensive story of, of MH370 as to where it is now. Hmm. And I mean, like you've, well, this isn't giving anything away, but you, you structure it with three episodes and each one is kind of focused on one of the three one of three contentious theories, but um, what is interesting is, is how something that's presented in episode one, I mean, then all of a sudden you forget about and it shows, pops up again in episode three. I mean, it must have been, that must have been a challenge in trying to tell that and, and interweave, interweave all those different rabbit holes that then do come together and then go back apart again. So that, that would be fair enough, wouldn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, and I think that's what, what's interesting, you know, it's, tr you know, people trying to piece together what had happened and then um, trying to, uh, you know, Flor Florence de Chongy, for instance, who is in mm. the, whose theory is in the third episode, one of the things that she did, and she'll say, say so, is go right back to the beginning. So she right. came a year on, she'd covered the story in the, in when it first happened in 2014, but a year later, she decided to look at it because things the, the, the plane still hadn't been found and the thing that she did was go right back to the beginning and look at everything that had happened and a timeline of events and you know Jeff Wise did a, a very similar thing so it's mm. all about people going back and retracing and trying to find out little pieces of information that then they could piece together. And so I'm gonna so I don't think we need to, nor probably you wouldn't want me to go into, let's go down the three different theories and all that kind of stuff. But um, let me pose this question. I'll go to Harry first. Do you, is, is there one theory in particular that you do give more credence to than others? When you're... Um, you know, I, I, I think Lou and I as filmmakers, you know, we wanted to maintain objectivity and distance mm -hmm. from not you know pull the threads together in perhaps the ways mm. that the people in our film do you know mm. i think one thing's for sure with this as lou said is the deeper you dig into this mystery the more questions you unearth and not answers <laughs> right so right. you know um you know and some some people who have been doing that have you know joined the dots some in more extreme ways than others mm. uh, but I think it's always been important to us to 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 refrain from doing that really um so you know we we present what the journeys that these people went on um yeah. uh Louise I, I suspect you're not going to say anything much different than that <laughs> than that no exactly and I think that's the yeah. thing you know um it was it's important for it was what we wanted to do was put the theories out there um mm. and it will be interesting to see what people take from those theories because mm. in, you know they're all laid out and you know as i said the people that have laid them out they've been involved in this story from the very beginning so they've spent the last nine years putting the pieces of this trying to put the pieces of the puzzle together okay well uh i think that gives us a good time to give our uh listeners and viewers an early break as they 
puzzle what we're even talking about, about all these different theories, which we've been very uh, hazy about. So uh, we'll be right back with uh, Louise Malkinson and Harry uh, Hewlin, the filmmakers behind MH370, The Plane That Disappeared, three-part Netflix docuseries, releasing on March 8th. You're listening to Factual America. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter at Alamo Pictures to keep up to date with new releases or upcoming shows. Check out the show notes to learn more about the program, our guests, and the team behind the production. Now back to Factual America. Welcome back to Factual America. I'm here with Louise Malkinson and Harry Hewlin, the filmmakers behind MH370, The Plane That Disappeared. Three-part Netflix docuseries. Uh, you've probably, it's already released. It releases on March 8th. We've recorded this before then, but uh, this is probably releasing about that time. And March 8th is the anniversary of uh, MH370's disappearance. Um, Louise, you've already said it. Um, the film is so much more than just the disappearance of a plane. Um, and you wouldn't say this, but it's almost a pretext for exploring other issues, I would say in the sense of like grief and how we deal with unexpe- the unexpected and the unexplainable and the need for closure even in a modern world this I mean, it would struck me as in one case the you know one of the family members they're just the power of touch just wanting to be able to touch something that maybe their uh, loved one had been close to even at the time of the uh, of whatever happened um and that uh I think that's a powerful side of this of this film. Uh, I mean, it's. Uh, did you would you say something more on that? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I sort of touched on it at the beginning, but that need for closure. Um, y- 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 when you see when you when you are around people who have suffered ambiguous loss in this way, you know, which is such a you know complex trauma because you know you can't. The, you, I think the mind goes between, you know, sort of the re- potential reality of what's happened, but then also the the faint hope that you know you might your loved ones might be alive, and and I and I think you know talking to next of kin from all over the all over the globe. So we've had you know we 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 spoke to people in China, we spoke to people in mm. Malaysia, we spoke to people in France, and in you know all across. Everybody's the same. We all need closure. We all need it. We know we need we need to be able to you know say goodbye. And the fact that they haven't been able to do that, and also again with this particular story, the fact that there's so few answers to all of those questions. Um, it's it's sort of an unimaginable torture that they've had to go through through all this time. Yeah, and maybe you could say, I mean, how are they? Yeah, as you say, it's nine years on now. Um, I mean, they they still go through this on a daily basis. But how are they? How are they? How are they doing? And how did they hold up? It may must be. I mean, we see it even in some of the interviews. It was it wasn't easy for them, obviously, to sit down with you and and relive this. Um, but uh, how are how I mean, nine years on, are they still searching for answers? That's that's the search that never ends, is it? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. And I think you know they're 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 a very strong community, and uh, you know, I mean, specifically the people that we've been speaking to. You know, they the next of kin come together um, every year around the anniversary, mm. for example. And there's still a very strong group of you know family that come together, and you know, for them. Um, they are well, are continually continually pushing for answers, and hmm. you know, they would they they they're pushing for uh, for the search to be resumed. Um, so they're not they're not going to stop. Um, you know, they they until they they they're going to keep going until they can going to get get the answers that they feel that they deserve. Yeah, and while searching for these answers against this amid this backdrop of conspiracy, and I think conspiracy theories get a Bad kind of have a bad connotation, but in many ways this does seem appropriate in the sense that it does sort of seem. I can understand where whatever whatever happened, it's it seems unlikely that no one knows, right? I mean, I think that's probably what gets behind a lot of these theories. But uh, I mean, Harry, maybe uh, I mean it's also an interesting kind of insights into how <clears throat> even mes- most well-meaning or not just just well-meaning kind of. Uh, condescending in a way but uh just well-meaning individuals can go down rabbit holes as you when when there is no transparency when there's no you know you you, you grasp at straws don't you 
I think that's right. I mean, you know, with with every mystery like this, conspiracy theories will always fill the void where there's an absence of truth, right? It's uh, people have to yeah. speculate because there right. aren't the facts to, yeah. to 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 come up with a watertight theory about what happened. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that yeah. that's what's happened in this case as well. Um, but, you know, I think for the next of kin, uh, often you know people 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 have suggested that you know it's it's traumatic for the next of kin to hear these various theories and mm. um but actually the truth is that the people that we spoke to you know yes they're confused they don't know the truth but actually they're just grateful that people are still trying to figure this out you know they're, right. they're grateful that people are still talking about it you know and and so for us you know our objective as I said earlier, you know, to explore the journeys that these people have been on, but also one mm. one thing became clear doing that was that, you know, it was incredibly important to to raise the profile of this story again. We're really hopeful that this series mm. will do that, um, and and hopefully motivate, um, you know, a new search or at least amplify the cry for a new search to to continue. Because as I say, you know, this is still. A story that has no ending and it will it won't have an ending until the plane is found well indeed and and it's incredible that yeah we're we're in no different place than where we were almost literally nine years ago you know in in many ways um how did you uh both of you i mean uh louise how how did you all become involved with this project um, well, the, the, the project um, was, uh, so, so Raw Production, who yeah. is in London, so it's, it, they were talking to Netflix about this story. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think, you know, in terms of stories to be told, it's, you know, the, as we've said, the greatest aviation mystery of all time. And I think it was something that they wanted to do. And then um, when they approached me about it, um, as I said, mm -hmm. I was... It, I was in. I, I knew about it at the time, but the more I sort of looked into it, the more interesting it was. And mm -hmm. you know, I think we might have said this at the beginning, but this happened in 2014. You know, it wasn't 100 years ago. So the fact right. that you know there we're in a world where there's telephone, mobile phones, and satellites and radar, and we can track everything, and we're always we're so used to be able being able to put the pieces of something together and then work out what's happened. And so to have so so, so such little amount of information to be able to do that with mm. um it was just it's just so compelling to sort of get involved you know to kind of start digging into um and so that's how i sort of got into it and um you know it's been uh, it's been a really interesting journey to be on mm. yeah uh and how about you harry how did i how did i come to the project yeah um, well, I was working on another an, another series, series producing um, at, at Raw, the production yeah. company where we made um, this series, um, and had heard that this was being made, and got very excited. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's for me. My my background is in is in true crime. Right. Um, that's producing television about it, not committing. Um, <laughs> it's uh, okay. Well. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so, you know, I think I've made films about missing people and without right, wishing right. to trivialize that, and it's always very yeah. tragic, I think yeah. people can get their heads around a missing person story. But when, you know, a 200 foot long commercial yeah. jet goes missing right. um, it's and, and stays missing for nine years, it's, mm. um, it's, it's it's kind of incredible and that's kind of what you know it, when this story broke i remember just in 2014 just being completely obsessed by it you know i think to right. this day i think it still remains cnn's like highest rating news event they were just running it 24 hours a day right right it's right. It, it people were just obsessed and and i was drawn into it too it just it doesn't doesn't make sense and the longer it goes on the more it doesn't make sense, you know, how can it be this long and it still not be found? You know, it's never happened before. And so I was really eager to work on, mm. on the series. And, you know, I met Lou and the executive producer, um, 
Sam Maynard and you know at the moment I've met Lou I've, I, I'm, I'm desperate to work with her you know I think we're mm. on the same page about you know keeping an open mind about this and investigating mm. it together and just going on this journey together and and also crucially realizing and knowing from the outset that the the real heart of this story is with the next of kin you know and that mm. we have to do do them justice with whatever series we made yeah I think uh no it's a uh, we've We've had at least one raw uh, doc on. We had Trainwreck Woodstock '99 on, although it was called something different back then. And I, uh, we, uh, do you know that? You know that? I've heard yeah. that story. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to. It was even almost a running joke. How many times? You know, was it going to be a drinking game? How many times did we say clusterfuck? Basically, <laughs> uh, and then the day before we release. Oh, by the way. Uh, the name's been changed. So, uh, but uh, no, it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, you, you guys are, you've, you've got a. I mean, do you, you do, both of you, been working with Raw uh, a decent amount? This was my first project at Raw, actually. Okay. Um, but okay. they make such fantastic shows. Exactly. And so it's absolutely fantastic to be able to come and work on something like this, and it's been absolutely brilliant. Um, so yeah, I was very excited to, to to be able to come and work with them on this. Okay, and uh, you, Harry. I worked at Raw on and off for about ten years. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, yeah. No, I think uh, I, I was. Uh, I imagine we're going to be hearing more and more about uh, Raw. It's. Uh, it's. Uh, and and is this a? Uh, I mean, because uh, you're. Uh, I'm, you're. U- it's UK based, right? You. We're all based here in the UK. And if I we'd been thinking, maybe I could have headed down to London and we could have done this in person. But uh, um, you know, and that's something we will start be doing more. But it's. Uh, is a do you see an advantage there from being UK based and then doing these? Well, this is more of a global international story, but I know Trainwreck was more of a US story. Does that uh, does that how does that play with uh, or does it make even a difference when you're talking to the Netflixes of the world? I mean, the big disadvantage to being here is it's freezing right now. Um, <laughs> so I'd much rather be where you are. Um, um, I don't, I mean, you know, I think Raw is a company that, um, you know, mm. just prides itself on, on, on putting decent, strong, hardworking filmmakers, interrogative filmmakers mm. um, behind their films, you know, um, and, and putting every penny on screen that they can, you know, and mm. so it's, you know, it's been a pleasure to work there for the last 10 years because, um yeah, Pro- opportunities like this come along, you know, for, yeah. to work on projects like this. Cool. I think the, uh, you know, having having the sort of um, Raw being so fantastic at what they do and then they have a great relationship with Netflix. And I mean, this this story in particular is a truly international story. So to have a platform exactly. to be able to, as Harry said before, get this story back out into the public domain is is fantastic. Well, and I I think you've definitely you're going to achieve that. So hopefully this uh, does. Uh, well, I don't know what uh, what will happen, but obviously hopefully someone I don't know. You've got some interesting indi- in- individuals, some very interesting characters in this film that uh, I'm sure are still on the case, and maybe more will join them. And uh, and for the victims, uh, well, for the passengers' families' sake, uh, hopefully they do get an answer sooner rather than later. Um, I mean, I think we're starting to come to the end of our time together, but uh, maybe I could ask what's uh, what's next for both of you. Uh, Louise, do you, uh, any projects you can share with us? Any more Raw projects? It doesn't have to be with Raw, but... Uh um, well, I'm not. I'm, I'm not a raw at the moment. I'm actually just finishing up on a. Um, I've done an awful lot of uh, crime stuff as well in the past, so I'm finishing mm-hmm. up on a uh, a series about organised crime in uh, the UK. Um, okay. But um, yeah, um, looking for the next project on the horizon. Okay, and you, Harry? I'm time with my children, Matthew. Oh, <laughs> sounds great. This this was a this job was all consuming, as Lou will testify. You know, we filmed around the world, but from our own homes. Um, yes. So no, all of the you know, jet lagging with none of the jet setting. So it yeah. was it was intense. You know. Um, and was it during the pandemic? A lot of this. And it was during the pandemic. Yeah. So, yeah. You know the challenges of of filming during a pandemic. I mean, we weren't we weren't well, unique well, in going through that at all. Where, you know, all the productions at Raw obviously were in right. around the world. But um, yeah, that made it 
you know it's a global story and yet we yeah. could travel to film anybody so it was it was tough so yeah right now i'm resting recuperating and and looking for the next project all right well uh well much deserved and i think uh, um you as you say you're both kind of do crime or true crime and that's um i mean what do you what do you think maybe i should ask one last question about this i mean it's uh don't want to say flavor of the month, but obviously true crime's big and streamers and things. Uh, I mean, this is, is this something you envis- uh, thought would happen 10 years ago and is how big it's become? And uh, what is it, do you think, that's so, um, that captures people's imaginations so much with these, these true crime cases? And which, I guess this is sort of a kind of version of that. Yeah, I, I, you know, I think, it, you know, it's it's huge now, isn't it? Um, but I think the, um, I think people are fascinated in, and this, you know, I mean, this is this is a mystery that has no end, but people are fascinated in mm. investigations and in solving things and in seeing how, you know, uh, true crimes, you know, crimes are solved mm. and things like that. And I think, you know, I think I think it will continue for some time. You know, I think people. I will continue to want that and um you know there's plenty of there's sadly um lots of interesting stories um, out there to be told i mean things that involve planes can be popular too people are very kind of uh, into because it's this whole thing we and things will get safer and safer with air travel we had one on the boeing incidents uh, and uh yeah, that proved quite popular. I mean, that's how some of my neighbors got to find out I was uh, I do this as a as a side gig, uh, <laughs> because uh, you know they they searched me and found we're looking up Boeing flights and things. There's something about that. I don't know. There's something. I don't know what it is, uh, but yes, it it does draw it draws us in. Maybe we can't put our finger on it, but it does draw us in. I think it's it's things worlds where there we all have a shared experience, right? So right, right. getting in the ocean, having a swim is what makes sharks scary, right? We all do yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Um, getting on a plane, we all travel, we get on trains, we you know. So I think the fact that we all share this experience, the idea that something could go wrong, it you mm. know, it creates this tension that people are just drawn to, I think. Um well, and I, I think it's going to pay the bills for you guys for, for many years to come. So uh, so congratulations again. And uh, Can I ask you then now what, what you think happened? Ah, you see, now... Um, you know, I... I'm I it's for me it's inconclusive based on what I because I just based on the three you put forward I I don't um you know it just because uh, because I was talking to my wife about it before I came drove over here it's just like because she she loves this stuff she loves true crime and things and this kind of stuff and I was just like all I know is that someone does know that's what I concluded there's some somebody I mean so even if you think the French, because, uh, you know, they're, they're you, and I thought that was well done. You have the guys, you know, oh, the she's making money off of this, right? Because, you know, that one comment, I forget, that one guy says, I forget, the guy who's part of the independent group, you know. But she does, she's done, she is an investigative journalist for Le Monde. I mean, she's not like she's <laughs> some, you know. And, you know, the nameplate's missing. That's interesting. There's no, I mean, I agree with everyone. There's no definitive evidence to prove anything. Yeah. No, no one single piece, right? I mean, even that, I th- relatively, you know, do-gooder has gone off to, uh, what is his name, Blake or Blaine or whatever who's, yeah, yeah who's gone... Yeah, who's gone to finds the debris? Yeah, there's debris now. I don't. Do I think the Russians planted that? No, but do I think the? Uh, but do we know it's defi- definitively from a Boeing seven seven seven? No, not at all. In fact, that's what the chief found out. Right, that it's only one piece that has been found could possibly be linked back to that plane. So that's I think is essentially something like that. So. It is just crazy. You know, the FBI stuff. I mean, I wouldn't be... Sh- I mean, I, I... 
wouldn't be surprised if something, you know, it does, that's why that whole AWACS thing starts sounding kind of making sense. You know, these kind of, and one thing, oh, one thing I was going to say, or you, maybe you, one of you did say it, these are all like, it's not like they're, these, you've got crazy conspiracy theorists on, right? Even Jeff Wise. But you start going down a rabbit hole, and yeah, you can start putting, drawing, you know, connecting the dots, and before you know it, you've got, you know, Russia's fingerprints all over this, and, uh, you know, and he, I mean, and he ties the guy to Russia, I mean, doesn't mean anything, really, I mean, it does and it doesn't, but it is interesting, you know, um, so I don't, uh, to be honest, that's an interesting one, I hadn't really thought about, which, I, I, the thing I came at with at the end was just that I don't know what to believe, I have absolutely no idea. And mm. and it just seems. I mean, the fact, except uh, I don't think anyone's ever going to find it. Mm. Yeah. It's if it's in a part of the ocean that's bigger than the United States, and it's as one guy from Australia pointed out, it's like you've got the equivalent of the Grand Canyon under mm. there and everything. I mean, I if that's where it if that's where it is. I mean, I think even in my intro, I say if you want to know, you'll hear it eventually if you listen to this or bother, but. Uh, disappeared without a trace over the Indian Ocean. Or was it the South China Sea? Or Kazakhstan? You know, I mean, <laughs> the reality is we don't know. And I think we're in a world where we don't feel like we can trust anyone or anybody. So the guys at Emerset or whatever the name of that company is, they probably, they seem, they kind of remind me of my dad. They're kind of engineer types, you know. I think they're kind of geeky types who probably didn't put a math formula together, and it sounds, but you can see why someone says, oh, but they've got U.S. contracts and things, and they work with the U.S. government, so who knows? Um, it's, it is a, I've never, I don't think I've ever seen anything that's so inconclusive, you know. Mm. And I think ultimately that was one of the biggest frustrations for us is we both yeah. came to it thinking, okay, we're going to get, no. you know, we're not going to solve it, but we're going to no. learn a bit more. Idea. One of them, and maybe it's episode three, is really going to be the one that kind of all the pieces fall together and it's a little more conclusive. But then, it, no, I mean, I, I do I think the, I mean, is it potential the guy went crazy and went flying off and went down? Yeah, there's potentially, but. You know, he doesn't strike. There's nothing there that would strike. You know, no one has found... I mean, if there was something there, if there was definitively whatever, he'd had mental health issues or whatever, that some of that, that would have come out by now, you know? Um, just like, you know, she's... The French journalist says, you know, it flew over... Uh, you know, there was all these, you know, military exercises at the time, and it went over an Australian air base, and it went... And no one spotted this thing. Um, I mean, I guess the thing is, too, you've got the woman who's very adamant in episode one, and then she comes back in episode three saying, oh, I've found it in the South China Sea. But then no one has found anything in the South China Sea. So it's, uh, it's I mean, yeah, I, I can see this film. Like, this must have been maddening. <laughs> Absolutely maddening to me. He never leave you. I don't think you know. No. It's it's just it's like a and that and that's what happens with this. You just get it. It consumes people, and and mm. that's what I mean. You know, like to think of those poor people who had loved one on that flight. It's just unimaginable. Mm. So yeah, yeah. And I know we got Netflix on here, but Netflix must have been at some point thinking, <laughs> "Where's the ending?" <laughs> you know. <it's, laughs> Uh, and good for you, Netflix, for uh, not not uh, being too concerned about that. I think uh, well, so. I appreciate that. But yeah, we're uh, hoping the ending is still to come, Matthew. Well, that's the thing. Yeah. That's the thing. I think that's very well put. Uh, really, thanks for uh, for coming on. It's uh, really much appreciated. Just to remind you, we've been talking with Louise Malkinson and Harry Hewlin, the filmmakers behind MH370, the plane that disappeared. Uh, it's a three-part Netflix docuseries releasing on March 8th. Louise and Harry, thank you again. It was great having you on. I also would like to thank those who helped make this podcast possible. A big shout-out to Sam and Joe at Intersound Audio in York, England. A big thanks to Amy Ord, our podcast manager at Alamo Pictures, who ensures we continue getting great guests onto the show and that everything otherwise runs smoothly. 
Finally, a big thanks to our listeners. Many of you have been with us for four incredible seasons. Please keep sending us feedback and episode ideas, whether it is on YouTube, social media, or directly by email. Please also remember to like us and share us with your friends and family, wherever you happen to listen or watch podcasts. This is Factual America, signing off. You've been listening to Factual America. This podcast is produced by Almo Pictures, specializing in documentaries, television, and shorts about the USA for international audiences. Head on down to the show notes for more information about today's episode, our guests, and the team behind the podcast. Subscribe to our mailing list or follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at Alamo Pictures. Be the first to hear about new productions, festivals showing our films, and to connect with our team. Our homepage is alamopictures.co.uk.